Welcome to the Brain and Body Podcast with Allegra Foxley, where we discuss a holistic approach to healing and health. Hello, I'm Allegra. I'm a trauma-informed body worker. I help people recover from post-traumatic stress disorder and a variety of other psychophysical conditions by getting them to connect to their body through conscious and subconscious movement. In the inaugural episode, I touched upon the fact that for true healing to happen, it's vital the brain, body and self are seen as a unit. Before I invite all the amazing experts and guests I've managed to secure onto the show, I think it's helpful if you have a basic understanding of how the brain, body and self work and interplay with one another. So today, we're going to embark on a deeper dive into the physiology and psychology that underpin this intricate relationship. In this episode, I'm going to give you an overview touching upon physiology, some sex-based cognitive differences between the male and female brains, and how our genes and our environment play a fundamental role in developing our neurobiology, brain function, emotions, personality, perception, beliefs, and behaviour. I talk about how beliefs, perception, and what we think have the power to change our physiology, affecting our physical health for better or worse. I detail the brain's various protective outputs and how these affect our physical and emotional health. Due to its very nature, there will be some scientific words in this episode, but hopefully I'll explain these in a way that is easily digestible for all. Before we begin, I'm not a medical doctor, neuroscientist or psychologist, and nor do I profess to be. I'm just someone whose brain, body and self were impacted by traumatic events and prolonged emotional abuse. As a result of which, I retrained, did a lot of research on the subject matter and developed a powerful system to help women to feel better, involving Western neurophysiology, ancient wisdom, energy healing and specialist psychophysical exercise from the trauma recovery world. I'm fascinated by this topic and I hope by the end of this episode, you will be too. I want to reiterate what I said in the inaugural episode of this podcast. If you are currently suffering from any unwanted symptoms, I recommend getting a diagnosis from a qualified medical doctor in the first instance. I cannot take responsibility for any adverse effects you may experience from trying a treatment or supplement discussed on this show. I cannot be held responsible for your health. It is your responsibility. Finally, before we begin, the words women, woman and female refer to anyone born gender female regardless of current gender identity or expression. And likewise, the words men, man and male refer to anyone born gender male regardless of current gender identity or expression. I'm in absolute awe and astonishment as to just how well made we are. I believe there's no architect in the world capable of creating something so complicated, so special, and yet so simple to this day. We are biologically extraordinary. We are a highly sophisticated integration of systems, nervous, endocrine, immune, etc., which support one another. When these systems experience danger, they can activate lots of outputs to protect us. We have the stress response that's led by the nervous and endocrine systems, We have an inflammation response which is switched on by the immune system but heavily influenced by the nervous system. We have the pain response which is led by the nervous system but is actually a neuroendoimmune response as well as other protective responses. Now these protective outputs run parallel to one another at the same time supporting one another. When these systems experience danger, a threat, which could be real or imagined, Our systems act like first responders at the scene of an accident or like best friends trying to help you. How they interact, however, is complex and hard to predict. Indeed, Steve Haynes, a UK's craniosacral practitioner, TRE provider and mentor, said that trying to predict what might happen when these outputs are activated is like trying to predict which grains of sand are going to be dislodged in a sand pyramid. If you keep dropping a grain of sand on the pyramid, most of the time the pyramid is going to get a little bigger. But every so often, exactly the same stimulus will cause an avalanche and a catastrophic response. And this is what can happen in the body 
resulting in autoimmune disorders like lupus, hormone dysregulation and hard to diagnose symptoms. I'm going to talk more about those protective responses later on in this episode, but to begin with, it's important you know how our systems work in the body. The nervous system is the foundation for physical and emotional health, so let's start with this one. It orchestrates our sensations, feelings, thoughts, bodily processes, emotions and behaviours, and consists of the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system. The peripheral nervous system is a vast network of 37 miles worth of neurons, which are nerve cells that feed sensory information from our external environment through the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, skin, and our internal environment via the organs, endocrine glands, fascia, etc., into and out of the central nervous system, which consists of the brain and spinal cord, to ensure we remain safe and alive. The internal checks, otherwise known as interoception, act as the body's inner eye, assessing what's going on with our internal systems, monitoring hormone levels, acidity, alkalinity, blood pressure, fat and glucose levels, the gut, hunger, hydration, menstruation, infection, inflammation, oxygenation, pain, thirst, temperature, tension, touch, etc. The external checks, known as neuroception, a term coined by Dr. Stephen Porges, acts as a threat detection system, determining whether or not we are at risk in our external environment from animals, people, geography, etc. Kind of like an antivirus software on a computer, constantly monitoring and performing checks, ensuring our internal environment is working in alignment with our external one. As humans, we are unaware this is occurring in the background because they are precognitive, meaning they appear before thought. Essentially, the retina in our eyes absorbs light and converts it into electric signals slash impulses, which then travel along the afferent branch of the peripheral nervous system via the optic nerve to the central nervous system. Just like a computer, the brain then processes, interprets the sensory information slash signals and makes decisions about potential outcomes based on a person's perception and guesswork. Perception is formed through our previous lived experience, education and knowledge and beliefs about the way the world is, so one person's perception of an event can be very different to another. For example, if you've been raised to believe that puppies are dangerous and will kill you, then the chances are, should you encounter one, you will instinctively feel scared and your brain will send electrochemical signals to your body's systems, cardiovascular, immune, endocrine, fascia, muscular, skeletal, etc., preparing it for potential action, activating the stress response. However, if you've been raised to believe that puppies are cute, Should the same puppy approach you, your perception and experience may be very different. You may experience love, happiness and want to play with the puppy. And this is because the brain has commanded the nervous system to send a signal to the endocrine system, which is a system responsible for producing hormones, telling it to produce the hormone oxytocin, which is associated with love and bonding. So two people can perceive the same situation very differently, depending upon their beliefs. And interestingly, most beliefs, most, not all, are formed in childhood by the age of seven. So, essentially, the brain makes decisions based on perceptual predictions, kind of like an actuary does at an insurance company. The brain assesses the risk and the potential outcome and then relays its decision, i.e. what action it wants to happen back to the body's endocrine, immune, cardiovascular systems, vital organs, muscles and fascia via the efferent branch of the peripheral nervous system. This is the doing branch, resulting in appropriate involuntary functions or voluntary conscious actions. We are constantly learning though, so every time the brain makes a decision, the decision and result gets recorded and will be referred back to when we experience similar events in the future helping to shape a person's reality, personality, memory and health. The efferent branch of the peripheral nervous system has two main subdivisions, the autonomic and the somatic. 
The autonomic nervous system, or ANS for short, is responsible for all involuntary subconscious actions, which occur automatically without conscious thought, keeping the internal state of our body in balance, which is known as homeostatic regulation, controlling the breath, blood pressure, digestion, emotions, heartbeat, inflammation regulation, metabolism, urination, etc. It also controls reflex movement, which are called somatic reflexes. These occur before we've even consciously thought about them. For example, the pupils in our eyes automatically dilate and constrict according to how much light exposure there is. We're not consciously aware this is happening, it just happens. The same thing occurs if we accidentally touch a hot frying pan or step on glass. We will instinctively move or jump away from the danger before we've consciously actioned it. The vagus nerve is the longest nerve within the autonomic nervous system, originating in the brainstem and connecting to all organs, most endocrine glands in the body, skeletal muscles and glands in the skin. It plays a big role in our lives and health, regulating heart rate, blood pressure, breathing, digestion, etc. It's the primary regulator of inflammation in the body and has two main branches – The sympathetic branch, which is responsible for action and fundamental in the fight or flight stress response, which I'm going to detail later. And the parasympathetic branch, which is the healing branch and fundamental in the freeze stress response. Due to its very nature, the sympathetic branch is usually more dominant in the day when we typically need to get things done. And the parasympathetic branch is usually more dominant at night when we are asleep. Hence why it's sometimes described as the rest and digest branch. The voluntary somatic subdivision of the peripheral nervous system is responsible for conscious movement and speech. If you're out of milk and need to go to the shops, you will instruct your body to walk or drive to the shops. And this is done using this system. So, to recap... The peripheral nervous system is located outside of the brain and spinal cord, in the body, face and skin. It has two branches, the afferent, which is a sensory network feeding information into the brain, and the efferent, which is a doing network responsible for autonomic, unconscious action and conscious somatic movement. Got it? Now... The actions of the nervous system, whether involuntary or voluntary, are only made possible through a complex interplay of chemical signalling messengers called neurotransmitters and hormones. Neurotransmitters bridge the gap between each nerve cell, known as a synapse. You've probably heard of some of the commonly known ones because of their power to alter our behaviour and emotions, like adrenaline, called epinephrine in the States, which can make you feel anxious or angry noradrenaline, called norepinephrine in the States, which can make you feel more alert and focused, or serotonin, which is associated with the emotion happiness. Unlike neurotransmitters, which act locally, hormones are released by endocrine glands into the blood circulation, where they travel around the whole of the body, influencing every single cell, including immune cells, nerve cells, liver and heart cells, etc., activating them into action. Dopamine, which is associated with the perception of reward and the emotion of motivation, is a neurotransmitter and a hormone. But all you need to know really is that these chemical messengers activate different parts of the body into action and have the power to alter our behaviour and our emotions, acting as neuromodulators to the brain. Now, coming back to the central nervous system, or CNS as it's often referred to, The brain can be split into three functional parts, the neocortex, the limbic system and the brainstem. The neocortex, sometimes described as grey matter, is responsible for our executive function. All logical, rational, conscious thought, emotional self-regulation, impulse control, gratification postponement, speech and language, memory, long-term planning, multitasking and voluntary movement originate here. It is, according to Robert Sapolsky, the author of Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers and professor at Stanford University, the area that makes us most definably human. It houses our consciousness, shaping our subjective experience, our perception and sense of self. And guess what? 
It's not actually fully mature until we're 25 years old. I'm going to come back to this area and its ability to affect our physiology later. On a side note, the reason I decided to name this podcast the Brain and Body Podcast and not the Brain, Body and Self Podcast is because the brain encompasses the self. The limbic system, otherwise known as the mammalian brain or old brain, is responsible for behaviour including the fight, flight, freeze, appease stress response, the origination of basic emotions and the processing of new memories. Finally, the brainstem, otherwise known as the reptilian or primitive brain, controls subconscious instinctual involuntary movement and is the main command centre for the autonomic nervous system. The brainstem is fascinating. You can have a person with severe Parkinson's disease, unable to walk and reliant on a wheelchair, but put them on a bicycle and their brainstem takes over, enabling them to ride the bike perfectly. This happens because the action's coming from the autonomic nervous system. The brainstem is also the area that is activated through neurogenic exercise, which is my area of expertise. Now, in terms of decision-making, the neocortex executive brain is the slowest to act and the reptilian brainstem is the fastest. So the deeper within the brain we go, the faster the neural process is. The thalamus, which is a nutshell-shaped cluster of cells located in between the neocortex and the limbic system, receives sensory information from the afferent peripheral nervous system about what's happening in our external environment, including all of the external senses except for the olfactory sense, which is the sense of smell. So it receives information on hearing, sight, touch, taste, and then acts as a relay station or go-between between rationality and our subconscious, feeding information into both the neocortex and the limbic system. Now, within the limbic system is an almond-shaped area called the amygdala, which is fundamental in the processing of our reaction to this external sensory information, activating the fight, flight, freeze, appease, stress response. It's also fundamental in the origination of basic emotions like anger, disgust, fear, happiness, hate, sadness, surprise, etc. and the processing of memory. The amygdala has been implicated in many conditions, including Alzheimer's, autism, epilepsy and disorders including sleep debt, post-traumatic stress disorder, major panic disorder, depression, as well as phobias and personality behavioural disorders like borderline personality disorder. We will discuss these conditions and disorders in length in future shows. Our survival stress response is the strongest protective output our body has, overriding all other systems, including immune, gut, fertility, growth and repair, etc. It controls our emotions, who or what we see as a danger. Our facial expressions, does this person look happy, scared, angry, a threat? Our mirror neurons, which are responsible for contagious behaviour like yawning and smiling. Our hearing and how we listen, our vocal cords and speech, our circulation, our muscles and how fast we need to move, our energy blood sugar levels and our ability to metabolise glucose, our fat reserves, digestion, our internal thermostat, whether it's safe enough to sleep, whether it's safe enough for us to carry a baby in utero for nine months, whether it's safe enough to lose weight how tight our fascia is, which in turn affects movement, pain and cellulite, when we need to defecate, pain receptor sensitivity, immune inflammation regulation and much more. It's an incredibly huge task. After all, if we need to run away from a tiger, our body has to prioritise which systems need to work to survive. From a neurobiological perspective, the amygdala receives the external sensory information from the thalamus and interprets whether we are in danger or not. If it deems there is a threat to our survival, the amygdala will instantaneously activate the hypothalamus in the brain into action, whilst at the same time shut down and override our slower acting neocortex brain function, essentially switching off logic and rationality. So you can see how it plays an intrinsic part in phobias. The hypothalamus is a small but crucial part of the brain, located below the thalamus, hence its name, which means under the thalamus. 
Despite its size, the hypothalamus plays a vital role in regulating numerous essential bodily functions, serving as a control centre for the ANS and the endocrine system, which includes the pineal, pituitary, thyroid, parathyroid, pancreas, adrenals, ovaries and testes glands. As well as this, it has a controlling influence on the immune system and plays a pivotal role in regulating sleep, temperature, hunger and satiety, thirst and water balance, and processing and integrating emotional responses. If the amygdala deems there is a serious threat that we could potentially survive, it triggers the hypothalamus, speeding our body up by activating the sympathetic branch of the ANS, into producing the neurotransmitter noradrenaline and stimulating the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis into producing corticotrophin releasing factor, a neuropeptide implicated in the emotion anxiety, which stimulates the pituitary into producing adrenocorticotrophic, which stimulates the adrenal glands located on the kidneys into producing the go quick hormones adrenaline and cortisol, increased tension, heart rate, oxygen and blood glucose levels, sweating and any other physiological processes in the body that are needed to fight or flight, whilst at the same time switching off processes that aren't necessary for the immediate survival, like fertility, digestion, growth and repair, etc., The hypothalamus will also action the immune system to produce an inflammatory response so that should you get injured whilst fighting or running away, it will make it quicker to heal. Now, if the amygdala deems the threat is most likely inescapable and highly likely to result in death, it activates the hypothalamus to slow our body down by activating the parasympathetic branch of the ANS into producing huge amounts of the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, which essentially paralyzes our skeletal muscles, slows heart rate and blood pressure, whilst at the same time stimulating the pituitary gland into producing endorphins, which act as an analgesic. So should a tiger have us in its mouth, we hopefully won't feel pain at the time of death. So basically, the amygdala acts as a threat detection system, which has the power to change our physiological state and override rationality. Now, coming back to emotions, in 1884, the James Lang theory of emotion stated that emotion is the result of bodily processes, meaning bodily reactions elicit emotions. The theory proclaimed that emotions rise in the neocortex, our rational brain, as a result of it feeling the bodily processes. However, in the 1990s, the scientist Damasio amended the theory, saying emotions are formed in the subconscious, in the amygdala, as a result of the bodily processes that are happening in the ANS. Basically, the afferent nervous system relays interoceptive information regarding the internal state of the body and proprioceptive information regarding our body position, force and self-movement into the amygdala and this affects how we consciously feel, giving rise to emotions. Different bodily responses can give rise to different emotions. An interesting example that backs part of this theory up is that benzodiazepines, sometimes called benzos, drugs that were originally developed to be used as muscle relaxants, have anti-anxiety effects on the brain. What happens is the medication relaxes the muscles, which in turn means the brain no longer receives signals telling it the muscles are tense, and as a result, the emotion anxiety decreases. Benzodiazepines are that effective at calming anxiety that they have been reclassified as anxiolytic medication. Now, before you all rush to the doctors to get a prescription for benzos, long-term use of them comes with an array of adverse effects, including addiction, overdoses, impaired cognitive ability, memory problems, mood swings, etc. Another example is the drug botulin toxin A, aka Botox. When it's applied to the muscles used in frowning, the muscles relax and people's mood improves. But when applied to the muscles required for laughing, your mood will be adversely affected. Interestingly, a recent small case study, which I will put in the show notes, actually showed that applying Botox to the Stelgate ganglion in the neck essentially blocks the fight-or-flight reaction that causes stress in the brain, resulting in significantly fewer PTSD symptoms. Now, Botox only tends to last about three or four months, so when its effects wane off, 
the PTSD symptoms will come back. So it's not a permanent solution, but may help some people who are resistant to other therapies to manage their symptoms. So putting this into context, if the sympathetic nervous system is activated, we're going to experience different emotions to when the parasympathetic nervous system is activated. When sympathetically aroused, we're more likely to feel anxious, angry and hypervigilant. When parasympathetically aroused, we're more likely to feel flat, disconnected, depressed and limp. Hormones can make you feel happy, sexy, horny, in love, content and so much more. Affection, altruism, empathy, love, openness, trust and warmth are all linked to oxytocin and serotonin and are the opposite emotions to the stress response. Anger is linked to adrenaline and cortisol. Anxiety, fear, guilt, shame and imposter syndrome are linked to higher levels of cortisol. Apathy is linked to low thyroxine, which occurs in hypothyroidism, and low dopamine levels. Depression and sadness can be caused by a number of different hormones, including adrenaline, high cortisol, low thyroxine, low testosterone in men, and low estrogen in women. Our ability to remain focused is linked to melatonin, which people with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, are often prescribed. Happiness is linked to estrogen and joy to dopamine. Our sex drive is linked to estrogen and testosterone. Disgust is linked to increased progesterone in the luteal phase of the menstrual cycle, which is the body's way of protecting an egg from possible outside poison. Jealousy is linked to high testosterone and cortisol levels, whilst risk-taking is linked to high testosterone and low cortisol levels, which is more often seen in CEOs, psychopaths and some women with polycystic ovarian disorder. Recent research has also shown that the gut microbiome plays an important role when it comes to emotions and emotional regulation, with it seeming to modulate brain and body health through the gut-brain axis. The gut-brain axis compromises of a network of autonomic neurons that connect the brain stem and spinal cord to the esophagus, gastrointestinal tract, liver and pancreas. The gut is often referred to as the second brain and interestingly it produces 90% of the body's serotonin with the pineal gland, an endocrine gland in the brain, producing the last 10%. It's a major energy highway running in both directions, communicating between all three of the functional parts of the brain, the ANS and our energy system. So the gut can influence the brain and the brain can influence the gut. If your gut isn't working effectively, then regardless of how expensive the vitamins you are taking, they will not be absorbed, leading to vitamin insufficiencies, ill health and altered emotions. According to Dr. Roger Sperry, the 1981 Nobel Prize winner for brain research, 90% of the stimulation and nutrition to the brain is generated by the movement of the spine. It's vital we exercise this daily, eradicating any blockages to ensure our energy can flow freely around the body. Probiotics are also suggested to keep healthy gut biome levels. Anxiety, depression, mood swings, memory, sleep issues and fatigue could be caused by having a fatty liver. The liver is the body's primary filtration system, filtering and cleansing the blood, detoxifying the body, converting toxins like processed food, alcohol, caffeine, drugs, supplements and prescribed medication into waste products that will be later excreted by the body through urine and faeces. It's also fundamental when it comes to metabolising hormones. If the liver is unable to do its job, hormone imbalances and toxin buildup will occur, increasing inflammation in the brain and body, giving rise to adverse emotions. Taoism, a philosophical and spiritual tradition originating in ancient China, offers a unique perspective on emotions, saying we're more likely to experience negative emotions if we're not in balance with the earth and our external environment. Sunshine is absorbed by our skin and converted to vitamin D, which helps to regulate mitochondrial function, aiding energy production. Energy is released by converting oxygen from the air we breathe into adenosine triphosphate, ATP, the primary molecule for storing and transferring energy. 
Vitamin D helps to improve serotonin production, so a deficiency in it is linked to increased depression as well as a weakened immune system. How in tune we are with the external energies of our world and universe has an impact on our physical and emotional well-being. By connecting to the Earth's electromagnetic field, not only are we able to reduce inflammation, pain and some autoimmune symptoms, but we're also able to increase serotonin, increasing our happiness levels. The practice, called earthing, walking barefoot in the grass or sand, is growing in popularity due to the emerging evidence demonstrating its efficacy. Modern life can restrict access to the electromagnetic current we need to thrive. Footwear, clothing, computers, electronic devices, wireless internet, electric pylons, mobile phone stations, pollution, etc., can sadly disconnect us from the Earth's natural electromagnetic field. Likewise, if we're staying indoors all day, not getting enough fresh air and sunshine, and having too much screen time, then our sleep and health can be adversely affected, and this will result in more negative emotions. According to Taoism, there are 12 major meridian channels, which are energy channels in our body, and each one is associated with a different set of emotions. They connect to the bladder, gallbladder, heart, kidneys, lung, liver, large intestine, pericardium, small intestine, spleen, stomach and the triple warmer. Qigong masters believe that we are more likely to suffer from premenstrual, perimenopause, menopause and postmenopause tension if our kidney, gallbladder and liver energy are blocked. Movement has the power to unblock these meridians, as well as increase growth hormone, noradrenaline and serotonin around the body, improving cognitive function and increasing happiness. Scientists now believe that the skeletal muscles work as an endocrine organ, allowing crosstalk between the muscle and other organs, including the brain. When we contract our skeletal muscles, they produce proteins called myokines, sometimes called hope molecules, which have the power to alter how the brain works, actioning the hypothalamus into producing dopamine and oxytocin, the hormones that are associated with love and bonding, increasing stress resilience, which can have a positive influence on mood disorders, such as anxiety and stress-induced depression. Stretching the fascia activates the parasympathetic nervous system into releasing endorphins, calming the brain's protective outputs, which is why at the end of a yin yoga class you can feel calmer, happier and relaxed. Now, with everything, it's about moderation. As you will probably know, too much exercise is stressful for the body, which is why long-distance female marathon runners can often stop menstruating, because the body deems it's not safe enough for them to carry a baby for nine months. Touch and self-touch also have the power to alter our emotions for the better. The power of a hug to calm a person down is incredible. Oxytocin is produced. It's why it's so effective when helping to regulate a child's emotions. I've obviously gone off on a complete tangent because it's my area of expertise. So let's go back to the amygdala. Once the amygdala has deemed the threat is over and we are now safe, it then switches off the signal to the hypothalamus, enabling the ANS to return back to its normal bodily functioning, returning back to homeostasis, switching on digestion, fertility, growth and repair, etc. The circumstances which led to the threatening event happening, how you managed to escape and the emotion that arose as a result of it are then processed and recorded as a memory helping you to learn to be afraid of things that are a potential threat in future. And this is where the hippocampus comes into play. The hippocampus is an area in the limbic system, which is said to look like a seahorse. We actually have two of them, one on the left side of the brain and one on the right. They are fundamental when it comes to processing new memories, which are initially deposited into their short-term memory bank before being transported to a different part of the brain for long-term storage. It basically stores two different types of memory, declarative and spatial. Declarative are related to facts and events, whereas spatial help you to learn pathways and routes, for example, a new route in a city. When it comes to the processing of emotional memories, 
The amygdafugal pathways projects information to and from the amygdala and the hippocampus. Now, the hippocampus processes information from all of our senses, including olfactory, to process memories. It's why when you smell a scent, it has the power to instantaneously remind you of someone and can bring back happy or sad memories. So the brain learns knowledge through thought, experience and the senses. And this is what scientists call embodied cognition. The hippocampus also communicates with the neocortex and as a result can play a role in switching off the stress response and regulating anxiety by producing memories that show the neocortex that when this threat happened the last time it wasn't actually as bad as you thought it would be. Now there are several points that need to be discussed when we're talking about the limbic system and its capacity to do its job. There are some sex-based differences between the male and female brains. The male brain's amygdala is typically larger in size in comparison to the female brain, which might explain why women appear to be the more sensitive sex. Interestingly, women are twice as likely to be diagnosed with clinical depression or with an anxiety disorder than men. Women also have larger hippocampi than men, with women being able to recall memories related to emotional events faster, stronger and clearer. Smaller than normal amygdalas give rise to overactive, intense, dysregulated emotions. Anger, anxiety, panic, terror, shame. And smaller hippocampi can lead to short-term memory problems and impulsive, reckless behaviour. People with borderline personality disorder, BPD, have smaller amygdalas and hippocampi. Borderline is thought to be a genetic inheritable trait linked to the genes DPYD and PKP4, which interestingly are also linked to schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. Now, with all three of these psychiatric conditions being exposed to stress and trauma in childhood and adolescence seems to antagonise them, with some being affected at an epigenetic level. Environmental factors can alter gene expression. Epigenetics is a relatively new field which is dedicated to focusing on how our genetic code is biochemically regulated and interpreted by the associated protein and methyl groups. Diane McIntosh says epigenetics is the interface between nature, the genes you inherited from your parents, and nurture your life experiences. Epigenomes are the globular proteins that hang around the double helix genetic DNA, working as enzymes which are biological catalysts assisting gene expression. Due to the way the proteins are attached to genes, they have been likened to the lights or baubles on a Christmas tree. The tree being the gene and the protein epigenetic markers being the decorations. Our behaviours and environment can cause changes to these proteins slash baubles which affect how our genes are interpreted. So if you don't take adequate care of the baubles or if you experience dangerous circumstances that are out of your control, your baubles can become damaged leading to potentially faulty ones being passed down to your future generations which will affect their health and Christmases. You may have heard of the eminent stem cell biologist Dr Bruce Lipton who was one of the first people to talk about epigenetics. Back in 1967 Bruce started experimenting with stem cells placing identical stem cells into petri dishes containing different environments. His results were at the time mind-blowing. He saw each petri dish produce totally different results one grew bone, another skin, another muscle, and another fat. He concluded, epigenetics reveals that the vehicles or the genes aren't responsible for the breakdown. It's the driver. He argues that each individual cell in our body has a nervous system, which contrary to popular belief is not the nucleus, which he describes as being the testes of the cell, but is in fact the membrane, which is responsible for neuroception. And this is why, from his experiments, the same genetically identical stem cell can grow into skin, bone or fat, depending upon the environment they are placed in within the Petri dish. 
How we treat our body today has implications for the health of our future children, grandchildren and so on. Our parents' experiences prior to our birth can directly alter our chemical and cellular development, altering the way our genetic code is interpreted and expressed. For example, if a man smokes tobacco as well as causing epigenetic changes to his cells, enabling cancer genes to be expressed, his sperm will contain these changes, meaning that his children are at a greater risk of developing lung cancer when they are adults and these are children who will have never smoked. There have been key studies in recent years that have demonstrated that epigenetic changes exist and can be passed through generations. Trauma experienced to the pregnant mother of an unborn baby can alter their future offspring's amygdala's stress response. Exposure to life events during pregnancy has been linked to increased risk of schizophrenia spectrum disorders in offspring. Granddaughters of women who were in a concentration camp in the Second World War have an above average risk of developing schizophrenia. Grandchildren born of the Dutch women who were pregnant during the famine at the end of World War II have an increased likelihood of obesity. A 2017 study at the National Institutes of Health, led by Peter Schmidt, MD, found that protein expression of four key genes is decreased in cells in women with PMDD, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, making them more sensitive to environmental stresses in the luteal stage. Maternal separation can alter genes in the amygdala that regulate the activity of neurotransmitters. Epigenetic changes can take place in your cells within your lifetime as a result of a traumatic event, stress or toxins. Epigenetic mechanisms give rise to stable alterations in neuronal function. People with post-traumatic stress disorder, for example, tend to have epigenetic changes leading to increased glucocorticoid receptor sensitivity. Women with post-traumatic stress disorder have an 8.14 higher risk of being diagnosed with PMDD, which comes with a significantly higher risk of suicide. Epigenetic changes can have a positive or negative impact. For example, when fresh cow's milk was first introduced to our diet in the Neolithic era, lactose shock occurred, which required an emergency epigenetic bodily response, which is why we now have lactose tolerance. However, if you are unlucky, then the impact can be negative. For example, in the case of women with PMDD, altering their cortisol sensitivity, affecting their stress response and stress resilience. The amygdala and the hippocampi contain a high abundance of sex hormone receptors and interestingly the amygdala's function actually alters during the luteal stage of the menstrual cycle which is the 14 days leading up to the menses otherwise known as the menstrual bleed. The fluctuations of the sex hormones can alter mood and memory, with some women being more sensitive to these fluctuations, which can result in severe premenstrual tension symptoms known as PMDD. Women with hormone sensitivity have a higher risk of suffering from prenatal or postnatal depression. During perimenopause, which is the 10-year stage running up to menopause, Hormones can fluctuate significantly, making symptoms more severe, with some being diagnosed with major panic disorder, MPD, or major depressive disorder, MDD. As you know, I wrote a book and devised a system called HTR, Hormone Tension Release, that helps women to release premenstrual and perimenopause tension from their body by calming the amygdala using neurogenic yin, which is a form of neurogenic exercise. I actually believe that all people, regardless of gender, should incorporate neurogenic exercise into their fitness regime because it has the power to create new positive neural pathways in the limbic system, regulating hormones and the immune system. Also, as a side note, I'm going to be discussing the topic of the brain and the female sex hormones on this podcast in April, which is PMDD Awareness Month, where I'll be talking with Dr. Gazala Aziz Scott, who is the clinical director and lead doctor at the Marion Gluck Clinic in Harley Street. 
Interestingly, the toxins we are exposed to on a daily basis, be it in beauty products, essential oils, cleaning products, plastic packaging, etc., all have the power to dysregulate our hormones, which can alter gene expression. I didn't know this until recently, but lavender oil, which is commonly used to soothe and calm children and often found in massage oil, can alter boys' and men's hormones, making them more likely to develop moobs, man boobs. The tap water we drink is said to consist of high concentrations of female hormones due to the contraceptive pill and also contains doses of antipsychotic drugs and these can affect the function of the limbic system. What we put into our body, the food we eat, the alcohol, caffeine, drugs we consume, all have the power to alter the limbic system's function and development. Poor nutrition is stressful for the body, hindering the liver and activating the inflammation response. Increased inflammation is linked to depression. Pesticides, like altrazine, which is commonly sprayed on foods, can physically change the genomes. Trans fats increase inflammation in the body. Food can be medicine, but a poor diet can be detrimental to your physical and emotional health as well as your behaviour. I'm excited to have Dr. Rachel Gao, author of Smart Foods for ADHD and Brain Health, who is an internationally recognised leader in the growing field of nutritional psychiatry, confirmed as a future guest on this show, where she's going to go into more detail on this subject matter. Adults who are exposed to stress in the womb and as a child, be it from adverse childhood experiences, otherwise known as ACEs, which are defined by the CDC as, along with familial violence, abuse or neglect and parental separation or death, any event that undermines a child's sense of bonding, safety and security, can also tend to have smaller oversensitive amygdalas. If you've got an overly sensitive amygdala, your brain's threat detection system is essentially going to be faulty, and this can have long-term implications and ramifications for physical and emotional health, making you overreact and oversensitive to external situations, activating all of the brain's protective outputs, stress, pain, inflammation, etc., when there may not be a threat, altering your perception of the world. It can even influence your political views, making you more likely to vote for extreme parties rather than liberal ones. From a health perspective, there is now overwhelming evidence suggesting a connection between ACEs and an increase in fibromyalgia, autoimmune disorders, cardiovascular disease, cancer and premature death as adults. It also needs to be noted that stress which could be from a high-octane job, looking after aged parents, raising young children, being poor, etc., can actually trick the amygdala into thinking there's a real-life tiger in the room that it needs to protect you from, when there isn't. When we are chronically stressed, our stress response can become permanently activated, dysregulating the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, and when this happens, the nervous system can become stuck and dysregulated, with the amygdala and brainstem remaining in control, making us more irrational and emotional, increasing stress hormones, whilst decreasing the hormones serotonin, oxytocin, dopamine, thyroxine, growth and repair, testosterone, progesterone, etc., decreasing our sex drive, impacting the gut-brain access and body processes, increasing inflammation and dysregulating the immune system, leading to gastrointestinal issues like irritable bowel syndrome, ulcerative colitis, estrogen dominance, fibroids, breast, uterine and prostate cancers, cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, restless leg syndrome, autoimmune disorders, chronic respiratory diseases, and the list goes on. It is estimated that stress is the biggest killer of humans in the world. It is responsible for four of the top five causes of death. Breathe. Maybe just hearing that has activated a stress response. Let's just take a moment to calm down. I invite you to take a breath in through the nose, all the way down to the belly, relaxing the belly and the pelvic floor before breathing out through the mouth. Let's repeat that. 
But this time, I want you to breathe out twice as slowly as you breathe in. Maybe breathe in for a count of four and out for a count of eight. Or three and six. Feeling better? Again, that's just a brief exercise which hopefully highlights how working with the body can calm the stress response and your emotions. So the brain and nervous system can change function in response to our external experience. If the brain perceives we are not safe, it will activate the defensive mechanism, stress, inflammation and pain. The pain response is very interesting. Up until recently, Western medicine believed in Descartes' Cartesian model of pain, which suggested that pain was the result of tissue damage to the area experiencing the pain. For example, if you have pain in your finger, it's because you have injured your finger. But this doesn't explain why people who've had their leg amputated experience phantom pain in the missing limb. Referred pain, sometimes felt in the ear, can be the result of inflammation of the sinus. Back pain could be from a ruptured appendix, which is located in the front of the body. Persistent pain, which is something many in perimenopause and menopause experience, is poorly correlated to tissue events. Sometimes pain can be felt a long time after an injury is healed. This is called allodynia. It's also fascinating because people can perceive pain very differently, depending upon their emotional state, with people suffering from depression being more sensitive to it. In 1958, China performed its first operation without using analgesia, opting for acupuncture instead. The operation was a success. No pain was felt by the patient. So we now know the Cartesian model of pain is wrong. Pain is a psychoneuroendoimmune response. The neurogenic exercise I teach, which involves neurogenic tremoring, can also help with pain. I injured my right hamstring attachment in December 2019, leaving me in significant pain and unable to do a basic yoga forward fold with my legs straight for 15 months. For 15 months, I experienced pain, even though logically my hamstring attachment would have been fully healed roughly after about three. The pain only stopped after what yogis would call me experiencing a kundalini awakening in March 2021, which was the result of my habitual neurogenic tremoring practice. This seems to occur more often in people who have suffered from or are recovering from PTSD and other dysregulated nervous system complaints because they are more likely to have previously suffered from energy blockages in the first place. The neurogenic tremors send a healing electric charge around the nervous system, essentially acting as a system reboot, unblocking and fully integrating the energy channels, helping them to work coherently for the first time in what can be years. When this occurs, the whole nervous system can light up kind of like a power grid, fully charged with a surge of healing energy that flows up the spinal cord and around the body communicating from the coccyx to the brain, releasing DMT, N-N-dimethyltryptamine, a powerful hallucinogenic drug which is produced in the pineal gland into your body, which can feel spiritual. When this happens, the brain has a moment of clarity, switching off all of its protective outputs, stress, inflammation, pain, and subsequently sends a message to the fascia, which is the connective tissue that surrounds your organs, telling it to relax, that it's safe, releasing tension, making your body work harmoniously. I've thankfully touched wood, not felt pain in that area since. My clients who suffer from fibromyalgia also tell me the practice helps them to keep their pain at bay, which means they sleep better. So just as the brain can adapt its functioning to external situation that it perceives as negative, it can also adapt its functioning to positive ones. And this is what we call neuroplasticity. They say a change is as good as a rest and to a certain extent they are right because positive change through learning new skills, seeking positive new experiences and education creates neuroplasticity, which helps to change our beliefs, emotions, behavior and health. For example, when we explore, learn and practice new motor patterns like neurogenic tremoring, which are elicited as a result of relaxing the fascia and skeletal muscles, 
The brain and nervous system change their activity by reorganizing their structure, functions and connections, creating new neural pathways which can help a person to experience new feelings of calmness and happiness, taking the brain out of a protective physiology, stopping the protective responses of stress, pain and inflammation. Now, neuroplasticity tends to only happen during rest and sleep. So this traditionally takes place the night following the neurogenic yin session, which is when the parasympathetic nervous system is more active. Perception is housed in the neocortex, the rational part of the brain, which has a controlling influence on the amygdala and is fundamental in helping to regulate our emotions and behavior. Functional connectivity between the amygdala and the neocortex isn't mature until a child is roughly 10 or 11 years old. Things that help form this connection include maternal bonding, which produces the hormone oxytocin, which also protects against amygdala oversensitivity. The absence of a reliable caregiver being present in a child's life can impact this development just as much as childhood trauma can. The UK is currently living in a cost of living crisis The old days where one parent, which was typically the mother, stayed at home nurturing her children, are gone. Indeed, Bill Jenks, a psychotherapist from Cambridge, says it's now got to the point in the UK where you'd need to be in the top 5-10% to of average household income, earning 60k plus to afford one full-time good enough parent at home. Conversely, on the other end of the financial spectrum, what's also interesting is that some parents will choose to send their children to boarding school as early as seven years old. I personally think it should be illegal to send your child to boarding school before the age of 11, and I question any parent's reasoning as to why they think it's acceptable to do that unless they are incapacitated. So, as you can imagine... There are many children currently who are at risk of being unable to regulate their emotions and behaviour as adults in the future. And worryingly, some of these children in years to come will hold powerful positions in society. They could be members of the cabinet, decision makers, people who get to decide whether to push a button or not. Dr. Daniel Armour, a psychiatrist based in California, has said that he believes anyone running for presidency should go through a number of neurological tests, including having their brain scanned, to understand whether they are fit for the job. And I have to say, I completely agree with him. Emotion regulation involves both body up and top down of positive and negative emotion. Sentience is the ability to be aware of the feelings and sensations in our body so that we can understand, interpret and make decisions accordingly. Sentience is vital for self-regulation and emotional resilience because if you're not aware of the signals your body is giving you, then it's going to be hard to address them creating change. A key component of what I teach clients when they first come to me and throughout all processes is to feel into their body to notice the sensations, to understand what stress, tension, love and safety actually feel like so that they can take control of their body and create resilience. Safety is the absence of negative stress and tension. It's not just your amygdala that's sending you messages telling you it doesn't feel safe. The body will give you clues that are a reminder that you need to practice more self-regulation and self-love. For example, I noticed that my rosacea, which had all but disappeared the night I experienced my kundalini awakening, returns when I'm not regularly practicing what I preach. The redness comes back when certain people, which I try not to have in my life, reappear. So I now view my skin as one of my threat detection systems. It's a reminder I need to practice more self-care and to distance myself from toxic people because they are toxic to my body and health. Now, for those of us who've been traumatized or have neurodiversity, where parts of the nervous system are more sensitized, and for people who weren't raised in a safe environment, feeling safe and knowing you are safe can be initially challenging. 
I advise anyone who fits into those categories to only do the following exercise with a certified trauma-informed body worker like myself because you will need specialist help to support you to understand what safety and love feel like and may need a different approach. So we're just going to do this exercise now. Can you remember when you last felt great, happy, Can you remember a time when you last felt no pain or tension? Notice the sensations you're experiencing in your body when you think of that time. For someone who has experienced chronic pain for years, this might also be difficult. Did you have a pet when you were growing up that you loved? Can you remember when you last felt great, happy, Can you remember a time when you last felt no pain or tension? Notice the sensations you're experiencing in your body when you think of that time. For someone who's experienced chronic pain for years, this might also be difficult. Did you have a pet when you were growing up that you loved? If so, do you remember the unconditional love your pet used to give you? When you're thinking of that pet, what sensations do you notice in your body? How has your body changed for the positive at the mere thought of your pet? Safety is soft, present, open, warm, expansive, peaceful, playful and relaxing. Steve Haynes says health is playful and creative. When you're stuck, it feels like you can't do anything. When we feel into our body, it can open up. In my HTR energy cultivation class, when I'm fully embodied, I get a big release when I feel into my heart and I visualise healing energy and love travelling to it. My chest softens immediately. It's powerful. It's important to notice the initial warning signals your body sends you on a daily basis. When we're busy, it's often difficult to notice tension in our shoulders, jaw, lower back, belly, fists, legs, etc. Taking agency can help you control how you feel. Set an alarm on your phone to go off three or four times a day. Mark Walsh, the owner of Embodiment Limited, who is also confirmed as a future guest on this show, calls these check-in times, where you are required to stand up, take a slow breath in through your nose, all the way down into your belly, and an even slower breath out of the mouth. Now bring your attention inside your body. Now without looking at your hands or feet, what size do you perceive them to be? Are they normal size, bigger than normal or smaller than normal? Is one hand bigger and the other smaller or are they both the same size? What temperature are they? Are they normal, hotter or colder than normal? Do you feel floaty or heavier than normal, like your feet are weighted down by heavy metal boots? If your answer is normal, in terms of size, temperature and weight, then congratulations, your nervous system is regulated today. If your answer was different to normal, then it's a sign of dysregulation. Don't panic though, this is easily fixable. If it's safe for you to do so, close your eyes again. Notice your breath, your emotions, and any tension in your body, including your feet. Relax, soften the muscles on the face, the tongue and lips. Unclench the jaw, soften the throat, shoulders, upper arms, elbows, forearms, wrists, hands, fingers and fingertips. Relax the back chest, lower back, belly, pelvic floor, bottom, thighs, knees, calves, ankles and feet. Take a few more slow breaths in and out, trying to make the exhale slower. Open your eyes and as you inhale, float the arms into the air, interlace the fingers and stretch. Stretch to the right hand side, then stretch to the left. 
Release the hands so you can paint the moon behind your back and interlace them again with your palms facing inwards and stretch again. Open the chest and feel the openness. Release the hands and then shake your body momentarily. Now look at your hands and fingers. Wiggle them. Wiggle your toes. Can you do a Mexican wave with them? Are they conforming? Now stroke your hands. Now tell me, what size, shape, temperature, weight do you perceive your hands and feet to be? Are they back to normal? It can be as simple as that. Our thoughts and focus possess transformative potential, modulating the brain's protective outputs, affecting behaviour and physical and emotional health for better or worse. A study conducted by the Cleveland Clinic Foundation found that just thinking about lifting weights can increase muscle strength by a whopping 30%. Now, this involved the participants visualising their workouts for 15 minutes a day, five days a week, but it involved no actual physical muscular work because, as you know, the brain is not a muscle. When you think about anything that makes you happy, your cortex will bring up a memory and this will excite your limbic system, triggering the hypothalamus into producing the feel-good hormones, neurotransmitters, dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin and endorphins into the body and nerve synapses, affecting bodily processes, calming the stress response, helping to regulate immune function and hormone production. Our beliefs determine what portion of sensory information enters the neocortex. Harnessing the power of belief can bring about profound healing, underscoring the brain-body connection. You've probably all heard of the term the placebo effect, which the website Healthline defines as when an improvement is observed despite an individual receiving a placebo as opposed to active medical treatment. Now, there are numerous medical examples where the placebo effect has had a profoundly positive effect on healing a variety of problems, including mood disorders, stomach issues, insomnia, chronic pain, inflammation, etc. What happens, according to Catherine Still, is the brain has a real response to the expectations and context surrounding the placebos, which can have an effect on the body. Despite popular belief, positive thinking on its own isn't going to cure cancer or infection. If you're suffering from those, you may need a combination of West and Eastern medicine. But studies have shown that if you believe a medication is going to work, it will enhance the effectiveness of the treatment. Thoughts have the power to calm the brain's protective outputs, stress, inflammation and pain. Hypnosis can be extremely successful in helping people reduce psychogenic pain, which is pain resulting from a psychological origin rather than a physical injury. And this is because it works on the brain and nervous system, calming it, reframing our perception. A healthy mindset is a key component to a healthy body. Several studies have shown that optimistic people are less likely to get ill and this makes sense because stress compromises the immune system and makes people's outlook more negative. Happiness is not a given. You have to work at it. Your health and longevity depend on it. There are other daily exercises that you can do to promote positive thoughts. For example, as soon as you wake up in the morning, say something that you're grateful for. Set a positive goal for the day, which will involve something you love doing. For example, I'm going to take my dog for a walk to the beach. Practice gratitude. Before you go to bed, name the positive things you liked about the day. If you have children, ask them, what was the best thing that you experienced today? It will set them up for a better night's sleep. Make sleep a priority. Sleep deprivation has the power to disconnect the amygdala and the hippocampus from the parts of the neocortex that typically modulate emotions, behaviour and impulsivity, meaning we are more likely to overreact to external situations, make risky decisions and not necessarily remember them. 
Innocent people have been convicted for murder because the interrogation process has denied them sleep for several days, resulting in the victims deliriously blurting out they did it, when in actual fact they didn't. Casinos allegedly deliberately have no windows and use bright lighting, etc. to confuse their customers into knowing what time of day it is and that they should probably go to sleep, resulting in more risky bets and the house winning. Music has the power to heal. How good do you feel when your favourite happy song comes on the radio? Every day, without failure, I put my favourite tunes on and I'll sing out loud. Singing stimulates the vagus nerve, which runs through the voice box and slows the heart rate down. Even if it's just for five minutes, it can make a positive difference to happiness levels. Learning a musical instrument is fantastic for neuroplasticity, no matter what age you are. If you learn a musical instrument as a child, it can help the child's brain to recover from some adverse childhood experiences. Learning a musical instrument at any age is fantastic for the brain. A 2013 study involving participants aged between 60 and 84 years old who were given piano lessons concluded that after four months of lessons, everyone involved experienced improved mood, attention, motor function and overall executive cognitive functioning. Singing in a choir is also great. Dr Stephen Porges says people are our social nervous system and he is right. Are you living in accordance to your purpose? If you are in a job that you hate and you're not using the natural gifts you are talented at, then this is going to impact your happiness. Obviously, it's a fine line because you have to pay your bills, but people who follow their purpose, which the Japanese called ikigai, tend to have happier, longer lives. Monitor your thoughts. Catch yourself when it's a negative one. Understand it's pointless and focus on something nicer. By focusing on something nicer, it has the power to create positive neural networks. Dr. Daniel Arman has coined the term killing the ants, which stands for automatic negative thoughts, which are limiting beliefs that pop up when we think about something scary or something we don't feel we're good enough at. These can typically arise on a daily basis, but aren't good for us because they create a stress response. He says there are four ways to kill these negative beliefs. The first is to ask yourself if the negative thought or belief is true or not. The second is to ask yourself what proof do you have that it's true because your brain can play tricks on you. Remember, your perception can be very different to what is actually happening. The third is to notice the sensations that are occurring as a result of these negative thoughts. And finally, the fourth is to now imagine how good it would be if you didn't have that thought. Feel how your body reacts to it. If you don't have a psychiatric disorder, it can be as simple as that. However, if you do, it's not as simple. You will need professional medical help from a specialist trained in your specific condition. For example, if it's PTSD or complex trauma, your treatment uh, will need to be by qualified people who are trauma informed, which means they're able to help you recover. And this can involve body therapy, psychotherapy, and potentially pharmacological treatment. Now, this episode has touched upon the stress response, but I'm going to dive deeper in the coming weeks and months into trauma, post-traumatic stress disorder, and complex trauma, otherwise known as CPTSD, which are nervous system disorders, as well as ADHD, PMDD, and many other conditions. So please do like and follow this podcast on Spotify, Apple, and YouTube. This way, you'll be notified when these future shows air. So to summarise... I want you to think of the body as a massive internet with IoT capability, Internet of Things. Signals are carried around instantaneously along the nervous system to the hypothalamus in the brain, which controls homeostasis and an array of devices, the adrenals, thyroid, pituitary, ovaries, testes, etc. Now the device does whatever work it's told to do, but if the signals don't arrive or arrive corrupted, your harmonious system can fail in surprisingly hard to diagnose ways. They say that psychotherapy that only involves talk therapy is like pulling a weed out from the garden but leaving the roots. The roots are in the body. Likewise, if you're only going to work on the body and not include the brain, 
then that too isn't going to be as effective because the brain and body are a two-way biofeedback system. So we need to include both for true healing to happen. It would be amazing if you would recommend and share this podcast with anyone who you feel will benefit from listening to it. If you want to follow me on social media, I tend to post the most on my Instagram account. My username is at Allegra Foxley. So feel free to follow me on it. You've been listening to the Brain and Body podcast with Allegra Foxley. Thank you for listening and thank you for your support.